Hi, this is Greg Thomas, and welcome to the Welsh American Channel. Today, I'm delighted to have Robert Humphreys as our guest. Robert is the director of the Great Plains Welsh Heritage Center in Wymore, Nebraska, and he's going to share with us the rich history of the Welsh pioneers in Nebraska and the surrounding region. Robert, welcome to the Welsh American Channel. Uh, it's a great pleasure to chat with you today, Greg. Right. It's wonderful to have you with us. Now, I'd like to get into a little history, if I could, and I'm just going to give a brief, rough history of the early Welsh migrations to this part of North America, and then I'm going to pass the baton on to you, because you certainly have far greater knowledge about uh, the Welsh history than I do. So we can look at history, the earliest British settlements in the East Coast of the USA had some Welsh individuals in the early 1600s. And we know that historically, preacher John Miles uh, led a group of Welsh Baptists to Massachusetts in 1662. Boy, that was so long ago. And they eventually established it, the town of Swansea, Massachusetts. Now, we know regarding larger groups that thanks to William Penn, there were Welsh uh, immigrants who came to Pennsylvania, later to what's modern day Delaware, created a couple of Welsh tracts beginning around 1680s. Uh, in time, uh, South Carolina was settled by Welsh Baptists in the 1730s and 40s. Later, a small group of Welsh migrated to uh, Cambria, Pennsylvania in uh, 1794. I think Evans Bird is uh, the town that's probably known uh, around it today. And then around 1800, or maybe I should backtrack a second, I believe that Welsh migration slowed down during the revolution. I'm going to assume that uh, because we were at war with Britain, that Welsh migration probably slowed down quite a bit during the revolutionary years. And then around uh, 1800, a few small groups of Welsh traveled down the Ohio River and settled in what is now the state of Ohio, where I'm from, the other part of the state of Ohio. They were down there in Cincinnati. And then uh, by 1818, another group settled in southeastern Ohio. And we've done a, a very nice video with Jeannie Jones Jindra the former director of the Madog Center for Welsh Studies. And she went into that history in great detail. That was a lot of fun, very interesting to learn of those things. And we know beginning in the 1820s, there were more Welsh migrations. Now you're talking about New York and Syracuse, Ohio, Western Pennsylvania. And I just want to ask you at this point, if you would just kind of pick up the baton. And I that was quick. And it was by no means complete. It was a very rough history. But ask you if you'd be kind enough to pick up the baton here. If you need to fill in any blanks, uh, Robert, feel free to do so. But um, share your knowledge with us, if you would. Okay. Welsh people really started to come to you know what we consider sort of the Midwest and the Great mm -hmm. Plains, starting right. in the mid nineteenth century. So there's a there's a quite a large wave, a significant wave of Welsh immigration to the Midwest, to places like Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, between 1840 and 1860. Okay. And there are a number of reasons for this. You know, obviously in Wales, there are, you know, you've had a growing population. You've had a lot of political unrest. In Wales in the, the 1840s, you have a, you know, you have increased population. You have less land for people. Of course, people are really struggling. Uh, yes. Most people are tenant farmers. They're struggling to pay the rent. They don't, they res many of them resent the fact that they have to pay the church tithes, right. established Anglican church that they don't wish to attend because they're nonconformists. Right. You have, uh, you know, people struggling, you know, just to, to farm a few acres. And they are hearing that if they go to America, they have the opportunity to own a lot more land to farm a lot more land. Mm -hmm. You may have people who work in industry, um, but they have that dream of owning their own land, of farming, of being more independent. And so, and, and of course, on top of this, you have some political unrest. You have the Rebecca riots. You have a lot of um, discontent within Wales. Um, some of which is is you know very clearly expressed in uh, the Welsh and the Welsh American press in the Welsh language at that time. So you have people. Uh, from Wales, and they, they, they're hearing about land in, in the, the Midwest mm -hmm. and uh, that land is being op opening up for settlement. Now, of course, another 
part of the story is that the land was already inhabited by native people. And so when people are coming to Wisconsin, the, 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 mm-hmm. there, there are still indigenous people, you know, Ho-Chunk, yes. for example, Wisconsin. And uh, unfortunately, in the 1860s, there was a, there was a tremendous amount of conflict in, in Minnesota, southern Minnesota, where the world settled with the, the Dakota uprising. So in this period, you, you have people, you know, coming from Wales, they're settling in Wisconsin and um, southern Minnesota is is another destination that that they mm-hmm. that they head to Iowa, and you also then have and it's not just people from Wales; it's people from other Welsh settlements in places like New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Ah. You have a lot of people who have worked in who are working in industry, in iron foundries, in coal mines, in slate quarries who are doing so just so they can save up enough money to travel west and purchase some land. And of course, when they would come out to the Midwest or the Great Plains, they, they are you know, going to the land office, they're, they're looking at the map with the land agent and and, mm-hmm. and uh, essentially staking some sort of claim to the land and, and, and purchasing that. So Welsh immigration to the, what we might call the Great Plains, Nebraska, Kansas, mm-hmm. um, the Dakotas. We're talking about you know some different uh, waves of, of migration here. Kansas is actually the place where where the probably most of the Welsh go on the Great Plains. Oh. You you have a fairly significant migration of, of Welsh people to Kansas for to farm. There are also some some coal mines in Kansas that that uh, Welsh people uh, are employed in. And uh, the Welsh start to arrive in Kansas. Kansas starts to be settled around the 1850s. And uh, there's a the town of Emporia, the city of Emporia, Kansas, for example, had a, a very significant Welsh population. Uh, in fact, uh, the first Welsh newspaper, the Columen Columbia, or the Columbia's Dove, sometimes it was, it was just called Col- a Columbia, was actually published in Emporia, Kansas, and then it was bought by a Drich. Uh, so there was a very significant Welsh population in Kansas. I should put a plug in here for a place called Arvonia, Kansas, the Arvonia Preservation Society. Um, there was ah. a little Welsh community not too far from Emporia called Arvonia, and it was okay. designed as a – it was initiated as mm-hmm. a very conscious attempt to start a Welsh colony ah. and in Kansas mm-hmm. uh, in the – around 1870 or so. So, again – 1860, early early to mid 1860s, you start to see Welsh people coming in more significant numbers than to Nebraska. And for example, there was a group of Welsh people who lived in Pomeroy, Ohio, which is in sort of I think northeastern uh-huh. Ohio. And they uh, they were mining coal, but they were attracted by the idea of land uh, further west, and so they got on flat boats on the Ohio River. They floated down, then made their way down the Ohio, Mississippi, then up the Missouri River to southeastern Nebraska. I think it was a six-week journey, and two of those weeks they were stranded on a sandbar. Oh, uh, so it was a difficult journey. And yeah. we also have people traveling over land as well. We have, in 1862, the passage of the, of the uh, Homestead Act. Mm-hmm. And that made it much, much easier for people to claim land. The United States government, of course, was was eager to essentially, you know, take the land that 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 had mm-hmm. been you know, ceded by the uh, indigenous nations, and then right. you know turn this over to settlers and and make the land in in their view more productive. And so, uh, so people were in, in, invited, you know, were invited to come to. To the uh, to the Great Plains territories, mm-hmm. and you know, stake a claim for for land, or or you know, apply you know, uh, find land and say that they sure, were going to sure. promise to improve it, and then if they mm-hmm. did so, after five years, it was it was theirs. So <laughs> it was essentially you know this yeah. free land, this land given wow, away yeah. to uh, to settlers. So that was something that was was very attractive to people mm-hmm. as well. Uh, the first Welshman we know of who who's mm-hmm. you know who claimed land under the Homestead Act in Nebraska was a man named Thomas Higgins and he has an interesting story he uh, he might emigrated from Wales uh, landed in New York City 
met his his wife Catherine, who was the daughter of Welsh immigrants in mm -hmm. Upper New York State, uh, in Upper New York State. Then moved uh, they moved to Ohio. Uh, there was a I believe there was a, a diphtheria epidemic which which um, mm. put them off staying in Ohio. Uh, they then migrated to Wisconsin for a few years. And then finally, they traveled to Nebraska and settled in southeastern Nebraska. And, and that that is where Higgins was the first to make a claim under the uh, a land claim under the Homestead Act. Uh, so, you know, that's just one mm -hmm. example of of, right. of, of, of of a migration story, really. And, sure. and sort of people, you know, it was a time when people could, at least, you know, these immigrants and settlers could, if they if they found one place difficult or they weren't successful in one place because of the way in which you know because of westward expansion they were able to you know move somewhere else and maybe maybe be more successful so so that was something that was was very attractive to to welsh immigrants i i will say that the number the actual numbers of welsh people who came to mm -hmm. nebraska it's a lot less than what you see in 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 uh, in Kansas. So Kansas, uh, there was I think there was a population of several thousand people ah, um, okay. by the late nineteenth century of, mm -hmm. of Welsh birth. Now, of course, right. when you're talking about right. the Welsh community, you're not also you're not just talking about the Welsh the people Correct. who were born in Wales. You're talking right. about their children. You know, they're sort yeah, of there's an extended community there. In in Nebraska, it was actually a much smaller number. It was only a few hundred people oh, uh, right. who came to Nebraska, and and but they did establish a number of of communities that that had a very strong Welsh identity. Mm -hmm. um, there were about I think twenty families initially that that settled here uh, from Wales or or of Welsh birth. You know, people were of Welsh birth, and and right. uh, they might have had their their children might have been born in Wisconsin or Ohio or Pennsylvania, but. Mm -hmm. But they were coming here, and there were about, I think, twenty families in the late nineteenth century, yeah, and they were the sort of the founding founders of that that Welsh Church mm -hmm. Bethel, which mm -hmm. you know, which is sort of the ultimately gave the impetus for what we have here today. And uh, but there are other there were other Welsh communities, uh, you know, uh, about uh, you know a couple of hours north. At north and west of here, there were uh, there's also a place called Postville, Nebraska, where there is a Welsh church. Um, there are other places that have sort of that have sort of faded away and become sort of mm. ghost towns, or mm -hmm. you know, don't really you know exist in it in any sort of real form anymore. Yeah, uh, but there might be a cemetery there, for example. And uh, you know, there there were um, there are quite a few of those places further west and and further to northwest here in in uh, Nebraska also if you if you go further west and I should explain a little bit about the geography too Please. so uh, certainly um you know each of the great plain states is a little bit different but here in Nebraska um the eastern part of the state the eastern quarter third mm -hmm. to a third of the state it is is very much more it's closer to it's closer to the missouri river the b before settlement it was mm -hmm. it, it was uh it was it was primarily what's called tall grass prairie so it was you know the very it was there was there was enough water for the the grasses to grow really really tall the prairie grasses uh and then you know the rest of the state, the further west you go, it's much drier. It's, you know, it was historically, and, and there still is a lot of this environment there, the short grass prairie. Mm. And there there wasn't as much access to, to water. And this was actually a huge problem for homesteaders, for example, when they were the further west they went. Uh, they actually needed to, to increase the amount of land that homesteaders could claim because, because, you, know, just, you needed more land to be able to make it productive, and you you sure. also needed access to to water. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know, one of the main innovations, of course, for doing that was the the invention of the the windmill pump. You know that yeah. sort of iconic, uh, that iconic structure that you see throughout the American West. You know, to tap into the aquifer under the the Great Plains, and you know, they, 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 oftentimes in the, in fact, in the mid 19th century, until about the 1860s, the Great Plains was actually referred to as the Great American Desert. 
Yeah. Uh, because, uh, you know, um, Americans didn't believe that you could you could farm there. They didn't believe mm-hmm. that it was it was productive. Now, uh, uh, or, uh, and of course, this ignored, you know, the, the, the ecosystem that was already there and the fact sure. that there had already been people, in some cases, even actually farming the land. Some of the, mm-hmm. the native tribes did in the 19th century United States was that, that this was land that was that was uh, not really, you know, even even suitable for for farmers. And this began to change um, in the in the 1860s or so as there was more pressure for people to move west and 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 westward expansion was continuing and mm-hmm. um, land was being you know was being sort of squeezed out of of the uh, the native of people by coercive treaties. But if you go further further west in Nebraska, uh, you know the the settlement was a lot sparser. There were actually some Welsh people who lived who lived out further west in Nebraska and um, who were fairly isolated from each other. Mm. Um, for instance, there was uh, you know just to, just to throw out some people here that I can think of, there was um, a man named Benjamin Nicholas. Uh, who was a uh, who had been a, a police a police constable in Pembrokeshire, mm. and he emigrated to the to ended up in Nebraska, and he um, he ended up being a very successful farmer and rancher out in Custer County, uh, Nebraska, and uh, but he was fairly isolated from from anybody else from Wales. There was um, another person that I have found was a man named Richard Bellis. And who was born in, uh, I think in, uh, he was born in Northeast Wales. I don't know whether he spoke Welsh or not, but he, you know, his birthplace is listed on the U.S. Census as mm-hmm. Wales. And, um, you know, he was another successful, um, a very successful farmer. You know, he, 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 like other people, he had had several attempts at sort of getting started before finally coming out to, to Nebraska. I will say, and then, you know, and I will say too that people also had there were also tremendous challenges for these uh, Welsh farmers who were coming to the Great Plains. Uh, the eighteen seventies, for example, there were some problems with grasshoppers, huge Ooh. swarms of grasshoppers that wow. would uh, that would just eat through a eat through the crops in a matter of hours, and um, this was of course a, a disaster for the sure. uh, for for the um, the settlers. And uh, eventually, I think it was 1877, I think there was a, a, an act, uh, a law passed by the Nebraska State Legislature that, that stipulated that every able-bodied man had to spend a certain number of days a year working on eradicating the grasshoppers, which mm. at that time, there was no, this was before pesticides, sure, so they are sure. literally, um, I think, scooping up as many uh, grasshoppers as they can before uh. they can do any damage. Um, but there are stories that these these swarms of grasshoppers would stop trains in their tracks. I mean, it was it was just oh like a huge cloud of of insects. Yeah. The the other the other problem, of course, was weather. And uh, if there was not enough rain, then you would have droughts, which would you know severely impact the crops. We we you know, and you have that coupled then with with severe and harsh winters on the Great Plains as well. Yes, and. Um, if you look at some of the Welsh periodicals from the, the late 19th century, um, particularly in the late 1880s, early 1890s, when there was a there was a drought, followed by some, you know, by the typical, you know, harsh, cold, mm-hmm. windy winter, you you see appeals from Welsh settlers to other Welsh people living in back east, saying we we need money, we need uh, we need donations of grain or food uh, so that we can feed our our animals, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, you know, as as well as ourselves. Mm-hmm. So so things were, were quite desperate uh, at times for some of these people. If you look up in in what is today South Dakota, in the early eighteen eighties, uh, there was a very deliberate attempt to to establish a community uh, in uh, a Welsh uh, a Welsh settlement. In uh, South Dakota, by a, mainly by a man named W. E. Powell, who uh, who uh, was often known in the Welsh was known in the Welsh press by his his bardic name, which was Gwilym Eriri. He was from uh, Beth Gellert, originally in North Wales, mm-hmm. and 
he had come to America. He lived in uh, Milwaukee, and he worked for the uh, for the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad. And he was an emigrant agent. And his job was to encourage people to uh, to settle on. You know, of course, there was there were lands that the railroad was able to uh, right. to sell to people. And of course, that that was good business for the railroad too. Is if you have you know the railroad would then be the one supplying Definitely, them with all taking sure. them there and then supplying them yeah, with, uh, absolutely. with what they, they needed to uh, to homestead yeah and so so he uh he, he was sort of the architect of 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 um what came to be known as Powell South Dakota and there was uh there were i think a few hundred welsh welsh people who went out there to 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 settle to farm mm-hmm. And uh, they were very, very optimistic. Uh, the eight, late eighteen eighties, early eighteen nineties come with the with the drought and the uh. Uh, very harsh conditions. Things were very, very bad for a few years, and mm. they were not they were not happy with it with mm. yeah. with what with with Mr. Powell. <laughs> In the end, however, that that community continued for for many decades. Um, it isn't well into the twentieth century, although eventually it, it uh, faded away. Mm-hmm. As uh, you know, as I think probably the. the I don't know the full history of of it, but I think the the, mm-hmm. the um, younger generation have moved away, and of course, you know, farm, farm change. You need as many people. I mean, that's that's actually something that happened a lot with some of these communities. Uh, you know, as you know, as farms became more mechanized and farms became bigger, it was a different type of agriculture that didn't require large families. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So people start moving away because they don't, you know, the jobs aren't aren't there in agriculture mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. And um, I know that that was actually something we heard when we were working on our video. The the town of Carroll, there was a Welsh community a place called Carroll, Nebraska, and uh, there were at one time two two Welsh churches there, mm. and um, both of those churches are you know, are now completely gone. They they they, oh they demolished. One of them lasted until about uh, two thousand and eleven, um, but the congregation dwindled away. It was the it was the Welsh Presbyterian Church. Mm-hmm. Um, we are very privileged to actually have a stained glass window from that church in our museum. Too. Oh, wonderful! So yeah. um, it is something. What a nice that, legacy. Yes. So we have yeah. that. We have that. You know. So we're, we're keeping the memory of of uh, the, mm-hmm. the the Welsh Presbyterian Church of Carroll, Nebraska, which was which was called Bethania or Bethany. We're keeping that legacy alive in our in our museum. Um, so. So you know, to sort of sum things up, mm-hmm. you know, we have Welsh people coming mainly, uh, you know, to the Midwest between eighteen forty and eighteen sixty, and then really eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties, eighteen seventies is when they start moving into the land on the you know the, into the Great Plains. Right, that's great. You've mentioned a couple of people as individuals. Are there any other individuals that you might say were leaders of the? migrations into you know nebraska or the dakotas someone you mentioned the gentleman who was the bard and the agent railroad agent he obviously had a leadership role you mentioned i think an individual can't remember his name higgins maybe the first yeah. individual who was welsh and and got the, the, the homestead act took advantage of the homestead act can you think of anyone else robert that may be kind of considered a a leader at, at that time well, I think I think you know the the, mm-hmm. the individuals I've I've mentioned so far. Um, yeah, you know Thomas Higgins. He wrote back to Welsh publications, uh, like uh, Edgy, yeah. for example, uh, say you know telling people that you know this was a good place to settle, come to southeastern Nebraska. Uh, you know, in southeastern Nebraska, it's right by the Missouri River. You have timber as well as 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 land. So sure, uh, you know it's it's. Uh, so, so you know, it was a very inviting place. You have, and you, I mean, really, I mean, it, it, I mean, yeah, there are some individuals who mm-hmm. did things like this. You have yes. Howell, for example, you know, who was making, really orchestrating, the, the the migration, to you know, to a specific place, and really sort of setting that up because he had the means to as a as a as a railroad agent. Yes. Um, you know, and he had the he had the access to to sort of advertise this and. And and then you know entice people and actually transport them there. Uh, one of the things that actually mm-hmm. he did was arrange 
tours so people could get oh, on a train wow. in Wisconsin and go to South Dakota and, and look at the, oh, wow, the, yeah. the land that they might sure. they might possibly farm and then take them back so they could think about it and then you know uh, and then you know, and, and then uh, make the decision to to emigrate themselves you know and, and there are actually accounts in the news in in a dream of uh of these trains stopping in various places to 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 pick people up either to emigrate or even just to to go visit so you know and he published pamphlets too and he and he also went back to, to he went back to to wales he went back to great britain he went back to europe he, he went to europe to to distribute this i mean because he wasn't just yeah i mean he was mm-hmm. very much attached to the welsh because he was sure. welsh himself right um, but you know he was responsible for getting any anybody out there yeah um, right and as I said, it was good for business. It was good for his career. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and he was also a poet himself. And, uh, you know, he was a, he was something of a celebrity among the Welsh because he, um, you know, he was often called upon to adjudicate at Eistedd Vodai. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, it was published frequently in the, the Welsh, uh, in the Welsh American press, you know, usually, you know, telling something that was exciting and interesting uh you know and he was a, a man whose opinions were 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 listened to and at the same time he was also you know you know trying to sell people on going mm-hmm. to south dakota so uh so you have him you know actually one of the i, I mentioned arvonia kansas yeah uh and uh the the man who uh who really instigated that was a man named john mather jones who was actually the publisher of Adrich, the, the Welsh oh, newspaper. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was called Arvonia after Arvon in North Wales, you know, mm-hmm. which is where Kain Arvon is. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was, you know, even the name of the place was meant to evoke, uh, you know, a Welsh, you know, a Welsh destination. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, there was also another place not too far from, uh, again, not too far from Emporia and, and Arvoni called um, Bala. Uh, Bala, Kansas, and Bala was another effort by uh, there was a sort of a group of of Welshmen in New York. Um, there was a there was a Welsh minister in Utica, New York, named uh, Rhys Gwessin Jones, and okay. um, he he and uh, you know a group of other prominent and fairly successful Welshmen in in New York State, mainly, you know. Acquired some. They they actually. I think they purchased some land uh, from the railroad out in in Kansas, and um, they said that it was going to be called Bala. For some reason, they called it Bala in Powys, um, which of course Bala in Wales is not in Powys, <laughs> but that's what it was called. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they encouraged Welsh people to settle there. Uh, it was a very optimistic project, um, and th- there was actually a, a Welsh. Community that thrived there for for uh, a couple of decades, and um, ultimately, though it 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 has it sort of dwindled, and and um, there is, there are some buildings there. There's still a, a, you know something mm-hmm. there. There mm-hmm. is a community there, but it's a much smaller community, okay. and and yeah. um, there is I think the the Welsh Church still stands there. Oh, nice! Um, though it's not used for that uh, for that purpose anymore. But um, interesting that one of the most interesting things about that community too is that. Um, uh, one of the the immigrants, uh, one of the Welsh Welsh people who settled was a man named James Sharples, and he and his wife were originally from Llanelli, and um, so he actually came from an industrial background, I think, and, mm-hmm. and then he uh, he and his wife had actually spent about twenty years or so in um, Brazil. Oh wow! Uh, they had emigrated to there. There was a an effort to create a Welsh colony in southern Brazil. Which is people often f- forget about this. It's, it's not really some. It, it wasn't successful, so people don't really talk about yeah. it. But mm-hmm. um, and 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 you know they never really got very many Welsh people to to to, to join them. And um, he and his he and his wife then left Brazil, and uh, they 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 lived in New Jersey for a little while, and then he came west to Kansas. Um, but when he when he arrived. His his teenage daughter only spoke Welsh and Portuguese, uh, ah. so so ah. there are some really interesting paths of yeah. migration to, uh, to the Great Plains. 
I feel like it's, I, I think there's a really interesting story, which I'd like, like to share too about, uh, it's, sure. he wasn't a, by any means a, a leader of this, but uh, there, there's a very interesting story about a name, man named Robert Owen Pugh, um, who was from Dolgethlai. And mm-hmm. he, um, uh, he migrated in the, I want to say the, probably the 18, 1860s or so. And uh, came to, you know, you know, typical path through New York, then came to, to Nebraska where he worked, he went out to Western Nebraska and worked as a ranch hand, a cowboy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he, he took a job as uh, an, uh, what was called an Indian agent um, with the Sioux or the, the Lakota in um, uh, at, at Pine Ridge in what is um, now uh, South Dakota. Okay. And that was where the, you know, and then there actually is a, a reservation, the Pine Ridge Reservation is that uh, today. And um, he ended up marrying a woman who was the, the granddaughter of uh, uh, an Oglala Lakota uh, oh. chieftain yeah. named um, Blue Horse. And, and her name was uh, Jenny Robinson, but, uh, but uh, you know, sometimes she's referred to as Jenny Blue Horse. Mm-hmm. And um, they had a they had two sons together, and so and, and he you know he he and his wife were you know they they lived on that agency. He was the government agent, which meant he was supposed to he was supposed. To, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these these people were very corrupt and and were just in it to get mm. money or to have right. you know a cushy right. government job. Mm-hmm. Um, he he you know not only being married to to a, a, a Lakota woman, he was also uh, you know, he was he became much more sympathetic to the well-being and became of of the indigenous people and became an advocate for them as well. And he actually um, traveled with the, with um, representatives of the Lakota people to Washington D.C. to give testimony uh, before yes. Congress. So that's a really interesting story. That, it is um, absolutely sort of brings together sure, the sure. the Welsh and you know the, yeah. the in, indigenous people of the Great Plains. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other really interesting, there are so many interesting stories. I'll bet um, there are. You know, one of the items that we have in our collection mm-hmm. is a shawl uh, that belonged to uh, the ancestor of uh, of our board president, um, Gwyneth uh, Kloss Colgrove. And um, this shawl was brought mm-hmm. from Wales. And uh, when the uh, when the family was first, they had settled in. Uh, they they came first from Wales to to. I think actually they may have been in in Upper New York State for a little while. Okay. They, they mm-hmm. were in the Northeast, and then they came to Wisconsin, mm-hmm. and then finally to Nebraska. And during that journey, one of the um, one of the the children, uh, an, an infant, um, died. Mm. And uh, this is the shawl that that baby was wrapped oh in my, yeah. until they um until they got to their new home and were able to uh, mm. to give her a proper burial so there's some very removing stories i mean items that we have in our in our mm-hmm. collection really has a, a story to it and um you know that's something that we want we really want to do as well is, is really tell people what those stories are and, and so that there's oh, sure. it's not just an object or mm-hmm. a, a document it's that there, there are real flesh and blood yeah, people absolutely. And stories behind every one of these, absolutely. and every one of these artifacts. Sure. So I have another question for you. Obviously, there's it's a westward migration, and in time, the way the story usually worked, as I'm told, is in time people move into a new region. The best land is taken. Then land prices go up. The land that's still available isn't desirable, or the prices go up. So people go further west, <laughs> right? Where there's so leaving Nebraska, where are kind of some of the areas that that these folks, or maybe their children or grandchildren, would have uh, migrated to if they didn't stay in Nebraska? Well, it's it's interesting because some of the Welsh settlers here in Nebraska, I know. Um, Headed west after mm-hmm. some time here. I know in right. Wisconsin, uh, there was some some of the people in this area. There, they headed 
west to places like Washington State, for example. Okay. Um, Oregon was seen as a very desirable place to settle. So there was a place out the out west called Big Bend, um, which I think is I want to say that's on the Columbia River, but at, out out west. Um, and um, so that that was a popular destination, mm-hmm. uh, Washington State. Uh, there were some people from Wisconsin who went up to uh, a place in Canada called the Wood River, which is up in Alberta, yeah, and uh, settled there. And then you know we just you you just also have people you also have people just just out of you know looking for different opportunities, so sure, they sure. they moved to different places. There was a couple named William and Phoebe Rollins, uh, for example, mm-hmm. and William had been born in Wales. I think his wife had been born in in North America, but um, uh, she was the daughter of, of Welsh immigrants. Mm-hmm. And they had uh, married in Wisconsin um, and a place called Fox Lake. And then they moved to uh, Nebraska and farmed in oh. uh, Nebraska. And, um, and also then they went, they lived in Minnesota for a little while because oh. they had uh, three daughters and one of them had married a man who, who lived in Minnesota and they moved to be close to her. And eventually this couple went to, uh, of all places, Long Beach, California. Oh, my. And yeah. there was one of the things I found when I was researching this couple, William and Phoebe Rollins, was that was that there was actually a fairly large population, or I should say, maybe not large, but significant population of mm-hmm. Welsh immigrants who had lived in the Midwest in places like Minnesota and had migrated to Long Beach, California. This is in the early, this is around the, the turn of the 20th century, around, okay. or actually yeah. around the time of the First World War. So, you know, between 1910 and 1920, mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. this growing population of Welsh people living in Long Beach, California. <laughs> Many of them had had spent time living in the Midwest and the Great Plains. Sure. Um, so, you know, and, and at that time, it was more about... You know, these were older people by this time, and and you know they weren't looking to farm anymore. They just wanted a nice place to retire where it was sunny and warm. And so, uh, and at that time, Long Beach, California, was was the place to mm-hmm. go. So, mm-hmm. um, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we we actually do have some things from the in our archive too from the Los Angeles Welsh Church. And Great. again, there was a lot of migration uh, mm-hmm. to uh, you know with you know the in, in the early 20th century is, is when you start, you know, you see these, these Welsh, I don't know, I don't want to call them yes. snowbirds, but because they weren't going <laughs> back and forth, but they were, you know, they were people who were, yeah. who were settling out there. For what it's worth, it's worth mentioning that, um, you know, uh, you know, I've been talking about these Welsh settlers. There were Welsh people who crossed the Great Plains um, before there were, you know, mm-hmm. there was significant Welsh settlement here. I mean, particularly during that period when it was considered the Great American Desert, yeah. and it was this obstacle to get across if you wanted to go to California for the the gold rush, for example. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. But there were, you know, several thousand people who were converts to the um, to the Latter Day Saints, the mm-hmm. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day right. Saints, or mm-hmm. the Mormons, who right. were who were crossing the Great Plains. Okay. Um, yeah. In the wagon trains, you know, during the um, uh, during the 1840s and 1850s. So that's another Welsh emigration story. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit separate from this one of people who were settling, right. you know, on the Great Plains. Yes, um, yes. But it's something it's something to remember as well. So, so yeah, I mean, people were moving on to other places. I mean, particularly as, you know, as, as I said, as farming changed, um, and we've heard this from the descendants of those Welsh families themselves, that, you know, mm-hmm. people, you know, People chose different career paths. Their children went off in different directions, and so some of those some of those communities didn't survive after after those changes. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned about the Mormon migration. I hope to do a video in the future about the rather significant influence of the Welsh on the foundation of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Um, yes. Some folks have given me some leads, and it looks like. People of a Welsh origin were just very significant in the formation, the entire concept and formation of that. So I hope to cover that in the future. Well, Robert, thank you so much for your knowledge and your historical insight on Welsh American history today.
Well, I hope you found this presentation interesting. Please let us know in the comments below and be sure to give us a like. And if you ring the bell, you will immediately be notified of new videos that we post. A special thanks to Robert for his time today. And I'd like to thank all of you for being part of the Welsh American channel. This is Greg Thomas saying goodbye for now, and we'll see you next time.